I know your commitment to free speech. I respect that because I think it's an integral. It's the foundational thing of, of democracies, really. But I also know your opposition to anti-Semitism. You've spoken about it, tweeted about it. That was Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu talking to Elon Musk at a Tesla factory two months ago. A lot has happened since then, and much of it has been fairly disastrous for Elon's social media platform of choice, X. The fallout continues for Elon Musk after the billionaire endorsed an anti-Semitic post. Lucrative advertisers like Disney, Apple, and IBM have pulled their ads from the social media site X. Yesterday, Musk denied claims he's anti-Semitic. He also threatened a thermonuclear lawsuit against a media watchdog company. Well, Elon Musk is now the richest person on the planet. More than half the satellites in space are owned and controlled by one man. Starting his own artificial intelligence company. Well, he's a legitimate super genius. I mean, legitimate. He says he's always voted for Democrats, but this year it will be different. He'll vote Republican. There is a reason the U.S. government is so reliant on him. Elon Musk is a scam artist and he's done nothing. Anything he does yeah. is fascinating yeah. people. Welcome to Elon Inc., where we discuss Elon Musk's vast corporate empire, his latest gambits and antics, and how to make sense of it all. I'm your host, David Papadopoulos. Last Thursday night, we released an emergency podcast after Musk went further in amplifying and agreeing with anti-Semitic ideas than he ever had before. The fallout from those posts is ongoing. Musk has rejected accusations of bigotry, but advertisers are still fleeing the site, and his CEO, Linda Yaccarino, is feeling the heat. Here with us today to discuss the latest in all things X and another wild development in the tech world, the power struggle at OpenAI, are our regular Muskologists. Sarah Fryer, who oversees our coverage of Silicon Valley's biggest companies. Hello. Max Chafkin, senior reporter at Bloomberg Businessweek. Hey. Hey, Max. And Dana Hull, who covers Tesla and has also been writing about the reaction to Elon's controversial comments. Always a pleasure. Okay, so Sarah, the past few days have been action-packed. Give us a bit of a refresher on what Elon said last week that people found so objectionable. Well, he was responding to a tweet that espoused a a very... um, racist theory about Jewish people that was actually tied to, I'm not going to repeat it again, you can listen to our emergency episode, but he said that is the actual truth. And then it caused this this backlash and uh, really shock from all of his his supporters and also his, uh, his advertisers. Even the White House put out a statement saying that, that this wasn't something that they were aligned with. And Furthermore, Linda Yaccarino, who is the CEO mm. of of X and who is supposed to be in this job to bring back advertisers to the platform, basically had to ignore it, had to ignore what he said and change the subject to uh, retaliation against a research group. So that's where we are today. All right, Max. So in the last few days now, what has Elon's response been? Well, so the most interesting thing about this to me is that Elon Musk, typically in these situations, somebody says a racist thing, uh, they apologize. And Elon Musk has not apologized, which mm-hmm. is very much in character for for Elon Musk. He's very much a, you know, never back down uh, kind of fellow. What he's done is, as Sarah said, denied the sort of central allegation. He's denied that he's anti-Semitic. And he's had some some sort of help from some of his buddies. But what he's largely tried to do is sort of change the subject. He's attacked Mm. Media Matters. And what has Media Matters done here? Media Matters, before this tweet, had put out a report alleging that X, uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter, was showing ads next to anti-Semitic content. Mm. And then Elon Musk tweets this thing, which really, uh, I would say reinforces the problem that Media Matters is counting out because because it's not just like as Media Matters saying there were some anti-Semites on this platform. The call is coming from inside the house. So that totally reinforces the problem with Media Matters report. And I think is part of what kind of kicked off the cascade 
of essentially advertiser boycotts. Right. Cuts. Just before we go through the Media Matters lawsuit, Dana, give us the exact lineup and the exact rundown. Who has broken now and called off advertising with X? Well, I just want to back up for one moment and make the point that Musk is blaming this on the media, that, you know, Media Matters, this research group and journalists like us have like made this into a maelstrom. But I want to be very clear that pretty quickly after Musk did this tweet, the American Jewish community came out with a very strong statement that said, Elon Musk's agreement agreement with a user promoting elements of the Great Replacement Theory isn't the truth. It is the deadliest anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in modern U.S. history and motivated the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Like, uh, he was called out by pretty significant organizations. Then the media wrote about it. Then the advertiser boycott hap- started happening. And so that's where we are today. But I just think it's disingenuous to sort of blame this on reporters when mm. you have some pretty large and significant organizations calling him out for the tweet in the first place. One other thing, which is that he one way he tried to cover up the damage uh, or, or to, to do a little bit of damage control was by sort of redirecting this to the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. So he's essentially trying to say, I could not be an anti-Semite because I'm incredibly pro-Israel, which um, just to say that is not those two things are not necessarily um, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And also, we haven't seen him enforce that. And also, it, it was this moment where, you know, you saw a lot of Jewish leaders who normally would probably have criticized him say, hey, that's great that you're doing that. And and they sort of seem to prioritize Elon Musk's power and influence over the conversation over any personal anti-Semitism or racism he may be espousing. And that just goes to show how how much control this man has and how it's very difficult for people to make an enemy of him for right. long. <laughs> All right. But Dana, can you give me that rundown of companies that have pulled advertising for Max? Pause is Pause. what I believe they're okay. calling it. Sarah, back me up here. I believe it's Apple, Disney, IBM are the big three. Those are the big ones. There are a few, a few banks, a few uh, communications companies, um, a lot of companies that already had a pause in place that are just continuing that right. pause. The 60% drop in advertising revenue um, that Musk has talked about, it doesn't seem to be reversing. All right. So now let's get into this, you know, Musk described it, I believe, as a thermonuclear lawsuit against Media Matters. It ha- the lawsuit has dropped, Max. And, and it says what? The lawsuit says that Media Matters report was contrived. It, it, it doesn't say... Manipulated. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't say that Media Matters made up these adjacencies. It says that Media Matters refreshed their Twitter feed so many Cher- times. Cher- they argue they cherry picked. They cherry picked. Yeah. And I'm not sure. Look, I'm not a legal scholar. I don't know if this is going to hold up in court or not. But I would say that the goal here, I don't think, is to extract a, a settlement from Media Matters. It's to basically respond to this general swirl of allegations in the most aggressive way possible and also You know, I think, unfortunately, to kind of create a chilling effect to make it more difficult for nonprofits and, yes, journalists. By the way, the the Center for Countering Digital Hate was already uh, facing legal complaints from X earlier this year. This is a pattern. He said he would go after the ADL, uh, the Anti-Defamation League as well. They ended up having a a somewhat of a truce. Mm. And and this is just a, a company that has made their API, which researchers used to, that's, called, that's an application programming interface. But what it means is that the, the way that researchers used to look at the content on X to figure out if there was misinformation spreading ahead of an election, to figure out what was going viral, what was happening in global conversation. Now that costs at a minimum $42,000 a month, which is incredibly unaffordable for any nonprofit to even hold X accountable in the way that they used to. So all of this to say X would prefer that the only data that we believe about that company comes from the company itself. So, so we believe that this attempt to essentially enforce something or have something of a chilling effect on, on, on the media will be successful, Max. I think the way that like media chilling effects were, it's not, it's not like a one-to-one thing. No, I don't think it's going to be successful because in certain ways, the lawsuit actually confirms 
certain aspects of the media matters report. I mean, he doesn't the the lawsuit doesn't dispute that these were real screenshots. It doesn't dispute that there were you know anti semites on this platform. It disputes that 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 media matters was overstating the likelihood that you would see an anti semitic ad next to that. And I don't I don't think it's going to have an immediate chilling effect. But when you see like a cascade of things like this, you know it 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 doesn't. It doesn't make people more anxious to 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 call out discrimination and and so on. And I, honestly, I think it's it's kind of a clever way for him to respond to these allegations without apologizing for them because he he almost can't apologize for them because it, it, this is sort of important to his like right wing persona. Like a lot of his fans would be really disappointed if he said, yeah. "No, I, I I totally misspoke. I need a, a moment right. of reflection." He doesn't want to do but, that. So this is a way to yeah. kind of. Zig. What strikes me is that it's kind of like with politics, you know, how like the po- politician does something bad and then the, the surrogates rally to the defense. You're seeing that play out now. Like, so Elon ha- creates this horrific news cycle last week, never apologizes. The Tesla board doesn't apologize. And believe me, like they had pl- ample opportunity to. No one puts out a statement. But then you see like Bill Ackman ride to the rescue over the weekend. And then yesterday, Sam Teller, Elon's chief of staff, former chief of staff, puts out a tweet. I spent nearly five years as Elon's chief of staff. In that time, I never observed a trace of anti-Semitism. He goes on and then like, you know, Elon responds, thanks, Sam, with a heart emoji. This is all a distraction from what's actually happening uh, at this company, which is that they've really reduced their content moderation rules because Elon Musk says he wants anyone to to speak freely. And in order to fix it, they're relying on this this community notes tool, which citizen journalists. Basically, like thousands of people who just rate tweets and explain why they're wrong or add context where needed. And and Bloomberg actually has a uh, an investigation out today showing that this system is incredibly slow. Um, it, it can take hours for viral misinformation to get a label put on it because it, it's this voting process that takes takes place. And then it's also really inconsistent. And it allows for repeat offenders who would have been banned under the prior Twitter regime to continue to post at at their pleasure. OK, Sarah, so earlier on, you reminded us that X's revenue, its advertising revenue, is down roughly 60 percent since Elon took over the company. We've had additional advertisers pull out now. You know, how much damage has been done and how existential is this? I mean, listen, Elon himself in the recent past has thrown out the word bankruptcy. Those are his words. And how does uh, Linda Yaccarino turn this around? Well, a lot of damage has been done to the revenue model. That said, they think that they can eventually replace it with the subscription business of paying for X premium. Um That is still not reaching even a fraction of the users that they would need for it to reach in order to replace the revenues that they've lost from advertisers. Linda Yaccarino, oh my goodness, I don't know where I where I start. I I thought that she would last a few weeks, maybe before she realized you were wrong, Sarah. I was so wrong. She's in it to win it. She's in it for the long haul. I, I am. I'm actually, you know, impressed with her ability to withstand, you know, all of the pressures of of this job and and still survive in the role. Her main goal seems to be to not get fired. She's she is incredibly devoted to espousing whatever Musk wants her to. So she was also part of this weekend spin of turning this anti-Semitic tweet backlash into a backlash over the media matters and bogus reports from journalists. What I love about this, though, is honestly, she is trying her plan, as far as I can tell, which Sarah was alluding to, is that they're going to just tack right. They see 2024 election is coming. Um, You got a nice size conservative audience on X right now. I mean, you know that we can we could have a debate about how big the audience is overall and and what engagement is like. But it's definitely clear that you got a lot of right wingers who are spending a lot of time there. And so her plan seems to be to to use this and and to and to sell advertisements to, you know, political action committees and uh, I guess candidates and and nonprofits again. This is not a huge market, and Apple and these advertisers that are pulling out are huge advertisers. And it seems exceedingly unlikely that you would actually that you'd actually be able to make up the difference. On the other hand, maybe they don't need to because 
Uh, it's a much smaller company. They've laid off, you know, a huge amount of the staff. Costs are lower, and you know, you but have this debt, like trickle but Max, of the debt. They owe an enormous trickle amount of, of debt, subscribers. Right? I'm just trying to give you the, 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 the bull, Linda, the bull case. you know, I the see. best case scenario from Linda's point of view. Andrew Tate is gonna like do, is gonna advertise, right? Like these right wing influencers are offering to sort of pay money. Okay, but but two things: right wing influencers hate being on a platform where there are no left wing woke people to troll. Um, and if there aren't any, then they'll they'll be bored. Um, and and the other thing is, all of these advertisers who are pulling out and making this big statement of you know we don't endorse anti semitism, it's not that big of a deal for their balance sheets to pull out of Twitter advertising. It's not that effective. It, they have Meta, they have Google, they have these other places to advertise. They don't need to be on Twitter. They were on Twitter because of the relationships and where it counts for Elon Musk in his government contracts, in his relationships with bankers, people aren't pulling out. Okay, welcome back. So somehow X isn't even the biggest news story in the tech world right now. OpenAI, a company that Elon started with Sam Altman before he would leave in a 2018 power struggle. Max, what what exactly has it been facing? For the love of God, what is going on here? OpenAI is pretty much the hottest thing, or was until a few days ago, pretty much the hottest thing in tech. OpenAI created ChatGPT, the the chatbot that that many people are very excited about, many companies are very excited about, very. and and Microsoft, you know, one of the world's largest companies, is has essentially put at the center of its of an entire like corporate over overhaul effort. We should say, first of all, OpenAI was co-founded uh, by Elon Musk, or Elon Musk played a, a key role in the creation mm-hmm. of the uh, of this startup, uh, was the main funder early on. And for years, OpenAI's CEO, Sam Altman, who was kind of Musk's partner in the in the creation of the of the entity, was going around saying, this technology is so amazing, it could end the world. Like, we really need to be careful here because AI could take yeah. over and the robots could uh, could somehow decide to annihilate the human race. And Elon Musk actually played a big role in kind of pumping up this idea. Now, mm-hmm. I don't think that OpenAI's senior management, I don't think Microsoft, I don't think Sam Altman ever really took seriously the idea that OpenAI was its little chatbot that can like write an email for you was going to turn around and annihilate the hu- whole human race. But but, but, yeah, but that is the very argument that they apparently made here but, when but they crucially, decapitated But uh, crucially, uh, unfortunately for uh, Sam Altman, uh, some OpenAI board members, uh, I think, do really buy into that idea. And we had this amazingly sudden coup that happened on Friday where a number of OpenAI board members, uh, OpenAI was governed by a nonprofit, it's kind of a weird structure, voted Sam Altman off the island, fired him, and they were able to do so uh, strangely without uh, consulting any of the venture capitalists who uh, invested in this thing and without uh, consulting it with Microsoft, which had put $13 billion into this thing. You know, it's funny because I grew up journalistically in Latin America and I witnessed a lot of coups. Some worked, some didn't. This has got to be the worst coup I've seen since the 2002 attempt to oust Hugo Chavez. It's been pretty bad. And right now, as we speak, Sarah Fryer, there's a mutiny uh, 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 going on inside OpenAI, correct? Yes. About 90% or above of the existing employees at OpenAI have signed a petition, by the way, including the chief scientist who is on the board pushing out Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. These people have all signed this this memo saying that if they aren't reinstated, they're out of there, which is it's it's wild. Right. Are, are all is Microsoft going to end up acquiring OpenAI for like zero dollars and and, you know, the rest of this is in their hands. It, are these leaders who were ousted going to come back and try to save businesses running as usual? It is one of the craziest like people have compared it to like Steve Jobs getting kicked out of Apple and brought mm. back or Jack Dorsey getting kicked out of Twitter and brought back. Those two situations happened over a matter of years. This is happening in a matter of days. So we're all not sleeping that much. But I do think he played some role here. Right, which is uh, what I want to get at, because, you know, we don't ultimately know all should be revealed at some point. But, you know, to a certain degree, yeah, it, it is interesting without 
really knowing anything. God, it seems like his fingerprints would be all over this. I mean, you told us the other day, Max, that the Musk, the Elon Musk, Sam Altman rivalry was a top 20 Musk rivalry. I had it at I top I think I but. underrated it, right? I mean, clearly this was a bigger, a more consequential rivalry than I had even anticipated. Yeah, last week we talked about Elon Musk going on the Lex Friedman podcast, and he said a few things that kind of anticipated this. He brought up Ilya Sutskever, uh, the chief scientist, uh, and and basically took credit for hiring him and uh, heaped a lot of praise on him and and also made a kind of complaint about Sam Altman OpenAI. He said OpenAI was supposed to be open source and now it's profitable. He he's been complaining for years that this is like a, a, a startup worth billions of dollars that he founded as a nonprofit. Mm. And what we saw with the board right was this effort. To, to take this startup, take this thing that Microsoft is so excited about, that venture capitalists are so excited about, and wrestle it back to its nonprofit roots, which, you know, does two things for, for Elon Musk. One is it validates this thing that he's been saying. He can, he can claim to be right, which he loves to do. And also it kind of does him a favor because Elon Musk just launched this uh, kind of haphazard. Are you uh, referring to Grok? Yes, I, I'm saying, I, and I regret to. Say it, I know that Grok has its its defenders and everything like that, but basically, this this thing Grok was assembled in a matter of months. Uh, there's, yeah, I'd say there's a little excitement among Elon's fans, but I don't think it's exactly caught fire. But now, all of a sudden, you have this utter crisis at at the leading player. I mean, I think that could only help uh, Elon Musk either in terms of recruiting or just in terms of getting people to try a, a, a different uh, chatbot. Right. Now, one other thing on this, Sarah, do we have any sense, right, because indeed, as as Max has said here, Elon played a role in the founding of OpenAI. He was the co-founder. He put $100 million of his own money into it. He tried to, to take full control at some point, and that didn't work out. But but he was, he was very passionate about um, trying to to prevent AI from getting out of control. And of course, this narrative of like, we've got to prevent AI from taking over is also somewhat self-serving because it's like, the only one who can save you from it is me. We should also say for future feud watching Mm. potential, Musk weighing in here, Musk, you know, hinting darkly that there must have been something going on that the public needs to know about. That Uh, is a big problem for Microsoft, which is like really trying to just clean up this mess. And it's a big problem for uh, the venture capitalists who invested in OpenAI. I mean, part of what makes this whole thing so wild is that is that like overnight, this incredibly valuable startup that all of these very powerful people were sort of banking on is is getting taken apart. It's amazing that this thing, Max, this thing went from apparently a value of eighty six billion dollars to perhaps zero in seconds, it's a hundred percent right. It's in a, it's a it's a staggering. If it really goes down it's, this way, yeah, it's not going to go down to zero. But at least I, I don't think it will. That's the thing, Max. This this tension, these relationships, they all go way back. Elon Musk yeah. has known Sam Altman forever. Sam Altman, by the way, was in the first Y Combinator class with Emmett Shear, who's now the CEO taking over. Um, it, maybe on an interim basis, we don't know. Uh, for OpenAI, all these Emmett people. Emmett Shear, Sarah. Emmett Shear. Emmett Sarah Shear is just simply uh, sitting in that position, keeping it warm until I think, as you once said, until Elon Musk takes that seat. Oh gosh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's Thanksgiving's the, oh coming God. up. One thing I'm I'm grateful for is that <laughs> that Elon Musk didn't end up getting that CEO role over the weekend. So before we head into our final segment here, we should mention that the SpaceX Starship launch that we previewed last week did indeed happen on Saturday and, alas, ended in flames. The flames, though, came a little later than the last time one of these things went up in space. So Elon is a touch closer to that Mars colony he's dreaming of. If you want to know what's at stake with the launch and all those going forward, make sure to check out last week's pod. Hey, note that we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon, and this is a very quickly developing story. The latest here is that Altman is apparently now in talks to return to OpenAI. Crazy times. Just two days away, everyone. And our thoughts here, at least, as always, turn to the Musk family table. In the past, it's been a pretty raucous and wild event. Max, paint us a picture here. What's it going to be like this year? I feel like all Thanksgiving dinners, to some extent, are exercises in, like, avoiding politics. And you're just trying to, like, sit there with your family, just, like, hoping 
Head, hoping, head down, just pray. We can't avoid it. Just don't go and there. And so, right. I mean, I imagine it's kind of the same situation, except it's all of them just hoping that Elon will, like, you know, not go on a wokeness rant, which, I again, like, that feels like a common Thanksgiving tableau, kind of brings everyone down, and I imagine that could... That's, uh, you know, almost inevitability. And, and the real the only question is, how do they kind of steer away from it? Well, listen, the one thing that I'm hoping for this Thanksgiving is so that Sarah Fryer can get a, get, get some rest and that there isn't some like enormous open AI slash X news on Thursday morning. OK, let's hope. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening to Elon Inc. And thanks to our panel, Sarah, Dana, Max. Great to be here. Have a great week. Thanks, all. This episode was produced by Stacey Wong. Naomi Shaven and Rehan Harmancia are our senior editors. The idea for this very show also came from Rehan. Blake Maples handles engineering, and we get special editing assistance from Jeff Grocott. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen. Thanks a bunch to Angel Rocio and to Business Week editor Joel Weber as well. The Elon Inc. theme is written and performed by Taka Yasuzawa and Alex Sugiyura. Sage Bauman is the head of Bloomberg Podcast and our executive producer. I am David Papadopoulos. If you have a minute, rate and review our show. It'll help other listeners find us. Happy Thanksgiving, all. See you next week. <laughs> 